Welcome to worship at St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Coburg for Sunday, February the 28th. I'm glad you found the time to set apart today to enjoy and take in this service of worship. And I pray that it helps you on your walk of faith. And I do look forward to the day when we're able to gather once again in person as a community of faith to worship our God. But let us begin now our worship service together with a responsive call to worship. We gather together seeking life in all its fullness. We gather in God's name, longing for what is real and true. We gather drawn by the words of our Creator and Redeemer. We gather to worship our Lord, who is worthy of all glory and praise. Well, friends, let's lift our voices. Let's sing the hymn, Be Thou My Vision. to Jerusalem. Many have gone before us, and many will come after us. From near and far, God's people gathered to celebrate God's goodness on the holy mountain. We, we are pilgrims on a journey. We are travelers on the road. Jesus often went to Jerusalem as a child to celebrate Passover, but now he has set his face towards Jerusalem again knowing this time will be different. We are pilgrims on a journey. We are travelers on the road. Jesus' last journey to Jerusalem is somber. He has no illusions about what is to come. Still, he goes ahead doing God's will. We are pilgrims on a journey. We are travelers on the road. Let us pray. God of light, we want to follow in Jesus' footsteps, but we have our fears and doubts. We would rather avoid the pain and darkness on our journey. Give us courage and perseverance when the journey is difficult and the grace to help others on the road. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. Jesus then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. Jesus spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adul adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels." 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have you ever had one of those days where just when you think you have it all figured out, you realize that you don't actually know what you're doing at all? Maybe it's a new hobby and you just think you figured the hang of it, but suddenly things don't work as anticipated. Or perhaps someone else comes along and does what you were trying to do in half the time with half the effort. It happens to me all the time. I figure that puts me in good company because it also happens to Peter constantly throughout the Gospels. Every time that Peter thinks he knows what's going on or that he understands what he needs to know, he discovers that he is woefully unprepared. Let's take a look at just a couple of examples. I mean, first there's the, the Transfiguration, a passage that we looked at two weeks ago and which actually happens immediately after the passage I just read, where Peter builds three shelters from Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. He wants to capture the moment, to keep everyone there, but he fails to realize that Jesus has come to do more work. Then there's that time that the disciples are out on the boat and there's a storm and they're all afraid, terrified. And they see this ghostly figure walking across the waves and they realize it's Jesus. And Peter gets out of the boat and tries to walk on water as well towards Jesus and flounders and begins to sink. And finally, perhaps the most significant and poignant reminder is when Peter denies knowing Jesus three times. And it hits home for Peter that he really and truly has failed to understand what's going on and why Jesus came in a very foundational way. And then, of course, we have our passage today. Once again, Peter is on point. He gets it. In the verses preceding what I read today, Peter declares that Jesus is the Messiah. But it's only a few short sentences later that Peter fails to grasp what being the Messiah means. Peter, and likely the other disciples, had one idea of what the Messiah should be. But this is not how Jesus understood it or how being the Messiah would be fulfilled. So we see Peter, he's got to have, has had a really tough time throughout the Gospels. But I think we can understand why, at least with our passage today, that Peter has such a difficult time. I mean, first, within our passage today, he has an idea that the Messiah is supposed to be a temporal leader, someone who will overthrow the Roman occupation and establish a new kingdom in the line of David. This comes out of the reality of them being subjugated people. However, the other reason that uh, Peter rebukes Jesus and is then himself rebuked is probably much more understandable. Jesus was Peter's friend. And when Jesus says that the Son of Man must suffer, be rejected, and be killed, Peter doesn't take it very well. He doesn't take it well because, like you and I, he's human. And we don't want life to end. Which is why when Jesus predicts his death, Peter tries to convince him otherwise. And I think each of us can understand what motivates Peter here. And I actually think that Peter did the right thing in talking to Jesus about this, about his death. I mean, what would you do if, if you had a friend who was on a path that seemed to be leading them towards being killed? You would talk to them about that because you're a good friend. I think it demonstrates the care that Peter had for his friend, who is Jesus. What our passage illustrates for us, though, is that we ha often have difficulty understanding and accepting God's plan. We as a people and as a society are still rebelling against that plan, which really, it, it's baffling that, that, that 2,000 years after Christ came, we'd still be 
haven't figured it out as a people. I mean, love one another. Care for one another. Make it your priority. If you take all the religious language out of it, that's how simple it is. And in religious talk, we would say, love God, love your neighbor. It's really that simple. Everything else flows from those two commandments. In order for us to better understand, though, what's going on here, what's going on in this, this really strange passage, why does Peter rebuke Jesus only to be rebuked by Jesus, and then Jesus goes on a little bit of a rant about losing your life to live and all sorts of things, what's going on? And unfortunately, and I say that because it's not my, my favorite subject matter, but we need to turn and we need to look at the original Greek that Mark wrote this in because it provides some additional emphasis that gets lost in the English translation. So in verses 35 and 36 of the NIV translation, which I read just a few moments ago, we see the word life twice and the word soul twice through those two verses. Well, in Greek, this is actually the same word, psyche, and it can be translated as either life or soul. And Jesus uses this word four times within those two sentences, and that should tell us something. Jesus says, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? On the surface, this sentence seems damning. I don't know about you, but I, I like and enjoy life. I believe God is the creator of life. And so reading a sentence from God's son about picking up my cross, following him, and well, we all know where that leads. To Jerusalem, the cross, the crucifixion, death. And of course, we know life and resurrection thereafter. But there seems to be a little statement of permanency about this. Which makes me ask, is there something going on here that I don't realize, that I don't see on the surface? And the answer, I believe, is yes. And we'll come back to that in a moment, but first, more Greek. You see, there's a curious thing that's happening in the Greek as well. And we find a parallel sentence structure in verse 33 and 34. And in the English, we don't see this at all. But in the Greek, it's apparent. In these verses... Jesus says to Peter and the disciples, you know, or to Peter, get behind me. And then in verse 34, Jesus says to the disciples and, and the crowd, take your cross and follow me. So the word in Greek that's being used here are opsio mau, which means behind me. Jesus says to Peter, get behind me. And if we pick up our cross and we follow Jesus, we are then by definition of following him behind him. The words opsiumau are used in each of those two sentences. However, in the second of the two instances, the one where we pick up the cross and follow Jesus, those words are redundant. Scott Jose writes, the second use of that phrase, opiso mao, is not necessary in Greek, since in the Greek verb to follow, it automatically carries with it the sense of behind me. So it's not necessarily necessary to spell it out, and so it usually isn't. And he continues, but Mark has Jesus repeat that phrase as a way to create a parallel to Peter in the previous verse. So maybe what Mark is saying is that there are two ways to get behind Jesus. If you insist on holding on to this life, of seeing the solutions to this life's difficulties by grabbing still more of the same life, then you can get behind Jesus as Satan. But if you are willing to let go, to release your fierce grip on your own ego, and on the life you hope will boost and bolster that ego, if you can just die along with Jesus, then you can get behind Jesus as a disciple. Then you can be behind Jesus as a follower who is back there with a clear view of what Jesus does so that you can then imitate him. 
in one way or another, everyone ends up behind Jesus. The question is whether you'll be back there so you can go where Jesus goes or whether you'll be back there to be left behind. And if you are back there to follow, then even though you die first, you will end up with abundant life in the resurrection. If you end up back there because you decided to make the good goodies of this life your be-all and end-all, then you will also die. But that will be the end of you too. And so there are two ways to get behind Jesus. You can actively follow and support the work of the kingdom, or not. If you choose not, then that choice also has implications on your life, on your soul. Reading this passage out of context, we may think that the purpose of Jesus and his disciples, of us following cross, of following Christ, is to suffer and die. However, when we read it and understand it within its wider context, the mission is to give life. Knowing, of course, that we will be opposed. Remember that tidbit I said a moment ago about holding on to about life, about it being good and being provided by God. Ira Digger writes, when we pan out beyond one or two isolated verses, we find that the overarching narrative offers a simpler but no less profound explanation of Jesus' death. Jesus dies because powerful humans oppose both his healing mission and, more specifically, the disruption that mission brings to established law and order. Unbeknownst to Jesus' opponents, they are opposing the inbreaking reign of God, of God's kingdom. Our purpose is in following, our, our purpose in following Jesus isn't so that we can throw ourselves against a wall and die. It isn't to get arrested, beaten, and executed as happened to Jesus. The purpose is to allow that part of ourselves that clings to the old order, the order of humanity, injustice, and disparity, to let go of that and to be reborn as something new. And that something new is found within the kingdom of God. When we recognize that many of the systems we participate in and which are perpetuated throughout society are repressive and harmful, then we want to die to those because they aren't life-affirming. We want to be reborn as followers of Christ who proclaim a different truth that frees each of us and celebrates the child of God that each of us are. And that, I believe, is something worth dying to. Thanks be to God that we have such a mission and a vision to proclaim to the world. Amen. Friends, let's come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for the vision you have for our lives, the promises you have made to us, and the journey you open before us. Today, we remember with gratitude the ways our lives are held secure in uncertain times by our trust in you. Moments in these months of pandemic that made us laugh or smile. Moments when we felt your gifts of courage and patience. Times when you helped us overcome temptation. The people who love us and give us encouragement. Gracious God, we are grateful for all these signs of your love in our lives. Thank you for the hope they bring us. Show us how to share this hope and love with others who are struggling in these difficult days. Faithful God, we pray for healing and restoration in the world that is our home. Hear us as we name in silence the needs and concerns we carry today. For we pray for people, places, and situations deeply in need of your grace, especially as they fear, face the fears and frustrations of coping with COVID-19. We pray for those who struggle to feed, clothe, or house themselves and their families, and all those who worry about their economic future. We pray for those who are weak or vulnerable for any reason, and for all who lack dignity and respect in our community. 
We pray for the earth and its well-being, that areas and species under threat will be cared for. We pray for peace with justice in regions of the world facing turmoil. And we pray for all those offering leadership and service in these times of hope and anxiety. For those planning how to offer vaccines in our community and for those uncertain about vaccination. By the power of your spirit, O oh God, work in us and through us. May we bring the light and love of your kingdom into our relationships and our community and all we do and say. Receive our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray in these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let's sing the hymn, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. my prayer for you is that you are able to get behind Jesus, to follow him, follow him in the way that he provides for us, to imitate how he cared for people, how he loved people, and that we can journey with him on the way, and that through this Lenten season, we can grow in that journey, we can grow in that understanding of what it means to be behind Jesus and to follow him. I pray now and the blessings, the grace, the love, the mercy of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, that they be upon you and yours on this day and forever. Amen. <laughs>